My name is Sarah Woodbury. I'm here today with my husband Dan to talk about Carnarvon Castle. So you've been teasing Carnarvon for three weeks or longer. What's so special about this castle? So we have this native Welsh friend who married an American woman and her father as a wedding present gave them a model of Carnarvon Castle. Our friend went to his wife, model in hand, um, which his father-in-law had made, by the way, <laughs> and said, I cannot have this in my house because it is a symbol of English oppression. Can I give it back to him? And she said, no, my daddy made it. It will hurt his feelings. So our friend took it into the backyard and he burned it. <laughs> so there's still some strong feelings, at least among some Welsh, about this. And certainly our friend, and as we have heard in Wales when we've been there, among many people, yes. This is the town wall and castle of Carnarvon. I was down in the um, museum downstairs and they were talking about the causes of the wars here in Wales. And the half hour video as well were very sympathetic to Edward and the English. And it prompted me to think of about the role of Carnarvon in the current Welsh consciousness and, and that it still, in a sense, is a symbol of English power in Wales. The video that they show here lionizes England. Edward was a great king, dismisses Welsh culture and what happened to Welsh culture after the conquest where Edward took the crown and the cross and, and Supposedly the crown had been Arthur's crown, so he adopted that for himself. Here we are in the rain again at Carnarvon in 2015, and I just wanted to say that they have completely changed the propaganda here. In 2014, when we were here last, it was very pro-England, and I complained that it was a symbol of domination still for the Welsh people, this castle. And now they've completely reworked all the exhibits, and it is much more even-handed discussion of the conflict that went on between Edward and Llewellyn. Carnarvon, to look at, has many of the characteristics of the, the rest of the Iron Ring, like Conwy, it's built on the water. One of the reasons that Edward built the castle here was it was on the lowland, so it could be supplied by the sea. There's the Manai Strait there. It was designed by James of St. George. It's got that planned English community associated with it. A medieval borough was established here that only English people could live in. At the same time, it was meant to be more magnificent than any other castle ever built. Okay, Carnarvon, the last castle on our rainy day. We missed opening times by 10 minutes, and thus we're filming from outside the castle. It was, at, you know, another amazing Edwardian castle. We are inside the gatehouse at Carnarvon Castle, which was intended when it was first begun to be the sort of the crown jewel of all of the castles that he built, the iron ring of castles he built around Wales to subdue the populace. This is a huge castle, vast, as you might say. This, what we're looking at here, is only half of it. It goes off in the other direction as well. It was intended to convey the power of England and the power of King Edward and to be a seat in North Wales. Um, compared to the Welsh castles, this is, this, is, this is like a country compared to a tiny hamlet. If you go there today, you can see that there are corridors inside the stone walls. Inside the walls at Carnarvon. But why did he pick this particular castle to be kind of the keystone in his fortifications around Wales? Because this location at Carnarvon has been the seat of kings since Roman times, um, really based on legend. So there's this legend of Magnus Maximus, who had a dream of a shining palace on the hill, which is taken to be Sagontium, the Roman fort located on the hill above Carnarvon Castle. You can go see that today as well. He had this dream that his, he would find his wife there. So he came to Britain, married the girl, and gave the girl's father rule over all of Britain in exchange. Welsh legend has 
a sort of a mythical lineage of the rulers of Britain that includes Magnus Maximus, this girl's father, and King Arthur. So what Edward was very deliberately doing was putting himself in that lineage as justification for the conquest of Wales. To sort of top all that off, he arranged for his son, Edward II, to be born at Carnarvon Castle. Later, he had his son named the Prince of Wales, deliberately to prevent any native person from being named Prince of Wales ever again. And from then on, the Prince of Wales has been the heir to the throne of England. Next week, I'm gonna talk about how this video wraps up this 43 episode historical arc and ask you what you'd like us to do next. The epic sweep the, of medieval uh, right. history right. comes to a close with our discussion of Carnarvon. Yeah, so. If you like this video, click on the playlist or subscribe to my channel. There'll be a new video next week. And if you want to check out my books, click on the link to my webpage.